Welcome to the Kaleidoscope Podcast. I'm your host, George Salas. Today I bring you a very special episode featuring the one, the only, Michael Brodsky. If you've never heard that name before, then that might be because Michael is a Kafkaesque hunger artist. Or at least that's how I see him. He's an example of a pure artist who suffers for his work. His first novel, Detour, came out back in 1978. Since then, he has written in the shadows year after year, decade after decade, knowing few, if any, readers will appreciate his craft and ideas. His only hope is for a posthumous discovery, and so, in a way, he writes for the afterlife. You listeners can change that. In my capacity as a volunteer acquisition specialist, I have facilitated the publication of Michael's magnum opus for Tough Poets Press. Two decades in the making. It's a veritable brick titled Inviticum. Before I found a home for it, Michael told me in an earlier text interview for the Kaleidoscope, quote, I'm willing to sacrifice everything to ensure that Inviticum is published. He considers it his most important work. If you only buy one book this month, buy Inviticum. Support an author who has stayed true to his art despite the only promise being oblivion. I first met Michael in New York City in February of 2023. We ate at a vegan Asian restaurant and then spent a good deal of time book hunting in the century-old bookstore Argosy. He was self-conscious to an almost David Foster Wallacean degree, but never anything other than kind, confiding, sincere, supportive, encouraging, and an intense listener. We bonded over many things, literature being the foundation of it all. Even though we are both busy and often drained from our various pursuits, every couple of months or so we send each other long emails in fond jest, my wife calls them Victorian love letters. Anyway, if you're tired of literature that bows down to preconceived notions and expectations, then read Michael Brodsky. Prepare yourself for a challenge, because Brodsky minds the interstices between minutes, between seconds, but also prepare for seeing and thinking of things differently. The following conversation with Michael will give you a clear idea of the man and the artist. Hey, Michael, how are you? Thanks for coming on the show. Well, I'm very delighted to be here, and uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it, it's a pleasure, and I'm honored to have you. And really what I wanted to do with this episode is, A, celebrate the publication of what is inarguably your magnum opus, 1,200-page novel, Inviticum. That, and I simply want to pick your brain about this book and literature in general. And although I'm eager to dive into our discussion about Inviticum, mm -hmm. I wanted to go further back in time to set a kind of foundation. And I'm just curious about young Michael Brodsky. How did he get into serious writing and how did he get into serious reading? Well, I would say from a very early age, which I can feel people yawning in the background, I just had a sense that writing literature was the country in which I wanted to live. I will, I will confess that until about the age of 15 or 16, I wasn't a, a serious reader. I was very much a serious TV watcher. Uh, when I grew, was growing up, TV was in its infancy and its, its toddler stage, and I consumed lots of TV series and the films, the Hollywood films that were shown on TV. You suckled at the boob tube. Yes, yes. What kind of uh, programs did you watch? Well, I don't know if some of them are being, uh, as I guess 
artifacts, but is more than artifacts, are available on YouTube. Uh, shows like My Little Margie about a young woman and her widowed dad and the, the uh, shenanigans that were perpetrated by the characters on the show. And uh, there was a lot of talent I felt, and I took these these shows very seriously. I mean, I, I, ha I have to be honest, and I'm grateful to them for existing. When I got to college age, I started seriously, seriously reading, not in the context of any particular course work, but... But it was compulsory based on uh, syllabi, as it were? No, no, it was completely self-driven, self-determined. I mean, I knew what I wanted to read and needed to read and loved, but uh, I never dived in in a very, very serious, uh, comprehensive way. I did, I will say that even, I don't know, in early adolescence or late childhood, I remember picking up The Wings of the Dove by Henry James, which I don't think, for what it's worth, is his, by any means his greatest work, but I do remember certain phrases on the very first page, and it sounds melodramatic, but it's true, that reading, reading this, the first page of that novel and having Henry James describe the heroine at this particular moment, waiting for her father, with whom she has a tortured relation, and James describes her mood or frame of mind as follows. I'm not reading from the book, but she tried to be sad so she wouldn't be angry, but she could only be angry that she couldn't be sad. And this stuck with me and it just confirmed what I knew and felt that, that literature was my true and only vocation. It was my home. It was my hometown, uh, and this is where I belonged. And I felt that I could, to a certain large extent, make my own rules here, there, sorry. And uh, again, I, I feel it almost degrades me to say that because I think someone who writes is more interesting if he or she says that nothing like that ever happened to me because that this confession, quote unquote, makes me comprehensible, predictable, whereas, but in any case, I think it's a, it's a truism that all, whatever adjective you want to use, all writers are great readers. So I think that's true to a certain extent. I would have to yeah. agree. And, yeah. you know, when, and whenever someone's asking for writing advice, I like to repeat the mantra that Werner Herzog is known to repeat ad infinitum. Read, 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 <laughs> read. So did you start seriously writing in tandem with discovering Henry no, James? No, I, I was writing, uh, uh, I guess, in, in childhood, late childhood. Uh, I do remember one incident where my mother who was by no means a reader and with whom I had a fermented relationship. I had, I had written this sort of mock imitation, not intentionally, of a Washington Irving story and uh, where I described the women of the village uh, sitting around gossiping and she somehow found that on my desk and was this confirmed that I was, I don't know, a lunatic or freak or ungrateful because she was offended by my description of these housewives as doing nothing but gossip so mm. she thought it was a reflection of her yeah i would say but uh, i have without trying to sound heroic i've encountered all sorts of resistances and through my life so they seem to have strengthened me their pain uh, criticism is excruciatingly painful but i mean i won't use a four letter word now but on on your program but it, strength, it strengthened me. When you say resistances, are you talking about trying to strive uh, and become a writer in particular or in general? No, I, I, I'm speaking the resistance I experienced from others. 
when I becoming think, a writer or 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 even conf or avowing my my sense of an absolute vocation mm. i don't know if i'm crazy about the word vocation but it's i think it you know it has a it has a power i mean a sense of of a commitment that uh, that's what i felt from beginning to end i saw a, a chopin concert in uh, Prague, if I remember correctly, or it might have actually been Poland. I, d I explored both of those places back to back, so they kind of meld in my mind. It must have been Poland, uh, perhaps Krakow. Uh, but the guy who um, set up the whole program, mm -hmm. we showed up early, my wife and I, and he asked me, you know, what do you do? I said, I'm a writer. I write fiction. And he laughed in my face. <laughs> There's <laughs> there's that sense of, uh, I don't know if it's resistance, but I don't think artists, in particular novelists, are held in high esteem in American culture in particular. And but he wasn't American. He was not. So, right. but, you know, a cosmopolitan and, and international. And <laughs> well, I don't, I, I don't know what would, you know, trigger that it just seems it certainly has nothing to do with you it has to do with with i mean i i don't want to well why not he was made uncomfortable by your avowal mm. and that had nothing to do with i suddenly i have this image of going to greece i went to greece only once and i was taking a walk in crete and i met this german i think he was an engineer and i told him I wanted to write, and and I've heard this played over and over again over decades, and it's forgetting about me. It's an interesting commentary on humans, I think. He immediately, there was an immediate effort to squelch me by talking about Robert Musil and how uh, the more he praised Musil, the, the, this served a double function to 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 convey his own sense of self-importance, Muzil's importance, and to squash me as a, uh, uh, an upstart, a delusional. And uh, I immediately gritted my teeth. And I felt that nothing is going to stop me. I'm going to encounter people like this all over the place. I had a, in medical school, one of the students who was a kind of irritatingly arrogant son of a bitch, you'll forgive me. And I said, I was interested in writing and I'm, oh, and he told me he had read Marquez and 100 Years of Solitude, which I've never read. But, uh, and after you read him, not you not being me specifically, but the world at large, after you read him, you don't, no, you don't want to write. Well, again, an effort to squelch, destroy the aspiring, I don't know, I don't. I don't want to paint myself as a goody two shoes. But if someone had had expressed that desire to me to write, to write a symphony, to choreograph a ballet, I think I would feel instinctively maybe threatened, but a kind of awe, and a kind of sense of duty that either I keep my mouth shut or I try to be encouraging, because who knows what this person is capable of producing. But the arrogance of stupidity, we'll call it, the arrogance of arrogance is unlimited in the world. And uh, this is what people are capable of. Do you relate to Kafka's hunger artist? Yeah, I, I, well, I do love that story. And uh, I, love, I love the borough even more. But yes, I, well, I remember from that story, the one phrase sticks out. Uh, at some point, the hunger artist becomes and i don't know i don't i don't read german uh basically except maybe opera german but he he had become by the end of the story an impediment on the way to the menagerie and i just remember that as being a a very kafka a shift in in vision where you start out as x but then in, in the end you become y an impediment on the way to to something else. In any case, you you brought it up, so I'm just I'm just saying, what the hell? Why mm -hmm. not mention it? 
Well, it almost gives the sense of a kind of uh, Buddhist notion of shedding the human shell. Is that the goal? Or should that be the goal of an artist? And once you get away with the human shell, you get to the core, to an essence. Is that how you read it or hear it? or Possibly. That's just what yeah. came to my mind when you I mentioned see. it. I see. I, I saw this as a, a, a sort of a, a variation on the theme of a certain defeat, uh, uh, defeat as a kind of poetic device, we'll say, where the the character and it is just a character a construction on paper by uh, the relinquishing of his identity his presence his his centrality reducing it to a a shadow of its former self to to, to go from being a, a person an entity into being an impediment on the way to a, a menagerie is 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 at the same time a poetic triumph the phrase and at the same time it's a reflection of i i guess i mean certainly if he wrote it he he believed it in some way a, a reflection of kafka's own sense of you know, hollowness or being shunted being being thwarted by fate by others well the whole story rings true for me as far as how artists are treated in the culture. I mean, American culture is what I know best, uh, for better or worse. And yeah, just sort of a, a kind of self-sacrifice that is unasked for, unappreciated. And why do we do it? Well, I think I've, I mean, having had parents who were not uh, by any, well, I thought my father had a literary gift on it was just there, but my parents were uh, not at all pleased that I wanted to. To I wanted to live only to write, and it irritated them and angered them, and uh, so I had. I think I was aware from the very beginning of hostility and uh, to to artists, so called, or uh, I don't think I had any illusions of, on the subject, and I I. Last year, I finally read the Custom House, which is, which is sort of a used as a preface to the Scarlet Letter by Hawth, Hawthorne, and uh, Haw, Hawthorne talks about his his stint as a a customs officer in Massachusetts, and he, he recognized with a kind of chuckle because he had I think he had a wonderfully impish sense of humor that many of these retirees from from these seamen who were retired and were given these kind of sinecures in the custom house c couldn't care less about you know what he wrote or didn't write and he just accepted that as you know he understood that his work was for a a limited number of people which which didn't make the seamen better or worse or it was just a fact of life and i i Try to I keep I try to keep that in mind when I kind of go off the deep end of complete enthrallment with what I write because I realize uh, even though even though it does doesn't stop me and I don't totally accept it that for most people uh, you could say more now more than ever I I don't know I guess it's it's now more than ever but uh, mo most people are not going to uh, care about what I write or when I wrote it or I, I, I think I was, I was trained or trained myself from an early age to recognize that. Uh, In our earlier text interview for the Kaleidoscope, uh, you basically told me that suffering in this way and other ways is a necessity. And you said, quote, torment is my bread and butter my cat's meow, my be-all, end-all, since it generates thought packets, which is a kind of, your word for a kind of um, compositional molecule, as it were. Yeah. Uh, so would you, in a sense, have had it any other way uh, growing up and uh, 
in that environment and all the other resistances that came afterward? I, I couldn't conceive of anything different. I, I mean, from an early age, there, there was a lot of torment that I experienced within the bosom of the family, which I have a very, uh, a lot of mixed feelings about. I think suffering is, I mean, suffering has a, has a kind of victimization taste, which I, I see suffering as a gift. Well, if I want to be a little coy, it's a gift. It's a, it's a, it's a trigger for, for, We'll call it defensive thought or uh, defensive analysis. Uh, it makes me feel alive in, in in a certain way. I mean, there's no, there's never a, a lack in the world. I mean, I, I'm sensitive to other people's capacity for viciousness, cruelty, unthinking stupidity. So there's, and there's this, of course, there's lots of disappointment. I mean, there's such such a thing as diminishing returns from, but to write, you need to have suffered intensely. I, I'm making the statement, which, you know, obviously is a, it is, it's categorical, it's probably false, and that's part of its charm, that it's false for, for many, many people. But, and suffering has to engender for me a kind of ferocity, wit. I mean, nobody wants to sit down and read about uh, to, to hear somebody complain about how they're misunderstood and how they're better than everybody else and all the rest of it. I think there has to be, there has to be a, an immediate stepping back from whatever one is feeling and an attempt to quote unquote analyze it. I say quote unquote because this is using the word analysis in a very loose way. Although maybe it's not any looser than, you know, uh, Sigmund Freud's uh, ventures into analysis or other, other kinds of analysis. But I think suffering, ang anger, hurt becomes a trigger for, for, for feeling alive and for putting the mental equipment to work. Do you think it's a necessity in the sense that there are no, there's no such thing? as a prodigy writer i i thought that was you, that comment in your the email you sent me if i can speak about that i i think that was it may i i agree there really aren't i mean there are prodigy poets i think rambo i mean was pretty young or would be considered a prodigy poet but it's i i can't i'm hard put to think of prodigy writers. I think there's a certain, I guess, element of having lived suffering, whether conscious or unconscious, that's needed a certain, I, I don't know, sexual experience required to, to embark on a literary, I hate the word career, because I don't know if I've had a career, but to embark on a literary a hobby. trip. <laughs> well, I was, I was, I was told by uh, one parent that, well, why don't you just make writing a hobby? <laughs> well, that that I mean, my hair stood on end, but I am again thinking of Hawthorne. I uh, can understand where that came from. There was a fear; it engenders a kind of fear, and I think many people I knew over the years could be very catty, cruel. There was something about my my uh, affirmation of myself that really got their goat. Going back a little bit, what do you think the difference is between writing a novel versus poetry in the sense, you know, that you could think of at least one prodigal example? What's the difference there? Well, I, I would think, you know, I'm not an authority that to construct a novel even if it's you know a, a very oddball type construction requires some sort of maturation or or collision with the world i think there are some great poets who for whom it's it's it it's not it wasn't necessary 
that that the the outpouring or did not require or is not didn't need to be predicated on a a body of of hurtful horrible profound experiences out in the world i i that's the best i can do or say and where where would it come from then if not that it's a good question give me a good answer i'm just kidding but i i think that most poets that i i mean i've read poetry i find it very frankly i find a lot of poetry very difficult to understand but i think i think even among poets a certain level of of, of experience of living was required before they began producing their best better important work i mean so maybe i maybe i was you know a bit too extreme in saying that well would you in a sense recommend to aspiring writers to open themselves up more to the different flavors of suffering <laughs> well <laughs> <laughs> if not go straight into bdsm well i i will say that i do uh, offer consultations to <laughs> to aspiring writers on how to how to uh, track down suffering and make it make it pay but uh, i i wouldn't i mean i think i'm a terrible example of would make a terrible guide to to i mean i think i can be a, a plausible father figure but as a as a as an advisor or guide to how to make suffering uh, a, a fossil fuel of creation I, everybody's different I, I i i i wouldn't pretend to understand or to to it to 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 guide someone on that course and i think whether you're look I think suffering has a way of finding whatever that means, whatever suffering means, it has a way of finding you. You know, I don't think you have to. You don't have to find it. Yeah, I think it will catch up with you. If if it doesn't, well, you're one of the you know, the happy few. But uh, can the happy few still write? Yeah, I'm substantive sure, I, fiction. Yeah. Well, I mean, Thomas Hardy, whom I love, and uh, wrote. I mean, Jude the Obscure, which for me is his greatest book, is is full of pain. I mean, my father read it at my suggestion. He just said, this is all pain. Uh, Hardy, apparently, I mean, it seemed to me rather disingenuous to use a, a word that's bandied about. I mean, I think when he said that it, had, it was not autobiographical, it, had nothing, it was not biographical, I mean, it struck me as kind of hard to believe. Or maybe he was just very frightened by, by what he what he revealed in that book but uh just just it triggers a the famous beginning of anna karenin uh happy families are all alike every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way i think i mean there is a lot of happiness in that novel by tolstoy i mean and it becomes but i but you what's interesting to me i haven't read it for decades is that the characters that some of the characters this the, the, there's the wife of Anna Karenin's brother who has the, these moments of ecstasy when she's with her children. And then there's suddenly, there's suddenly this, this, I guess, bipolar sinking into the depths of rage or despair. So uh, you can be happy and also despairing or, or, but then again, I think there are people who have a lot of equanimity and can write. And even if they're they're content or happy, I I don't pretend to understand. I just know that I suffering. I think breeds a kind of discipline. I mean, if you can uh, if you can somehow master it, and even at the most horrible or horrifying or painful moments, to sort of know sort of calculatingly that this is going to be of use to you, that this is going to push you a little further ahead into self-understanding or rage at the world and, and analysis of why you're feeling rage and why this, that, and the other. I guess, who am I to say that you can't be 
happy-go-lucky and write a masterpiece. Regardless of the mental state or physical state of a writer, do you think fiction that can be described as happy is worthwhile? Because I remember uh, after my father reappeared um, after a, for several years, after his vanishing and then his second vanishing, uh, he had read some of my stories and said, why are these all sad? Why don't you write something happy? Well, ba based on my experience with my own parents, I would say that uh, that sounds very familiar to me. I mean, uh, obviously he was frightened. I hate to use the word challenged because it's a euphemism, but there was something threatening about your stories. But also by default, um, the world in crisis or the mental world in crisis is more intriguing and more fruitful than a utopia. Would you agree? Yes, but I, I, I somehow associate with Gertrude Stein, whatever you may think of her later books or not, pointed out that something to the effect that the most interesting material or subjects are not about abnormality or aberration or, or extreme negative states, but I may be misquoting her and maybe I fell asleep and dreamt that she said it, but I, I could see how as a statement, there's a certain kind of, if not truth, a certain kind of charm and challenge in that idea that that suffering and torment is more profound that vision is misguided or overrated or and that it's much harder to somehow extract from neutrality or yes uh well-being a, a a profundity a level of profundity so i try to keep that in mind but i don't think i can really I think it's an interesting construction or uh, something interesting to think about, but I don't know if it really has much application to me. Hmm. We've talked about the world, the external world of suffering. Uh, what about the internal world of composition? Do you find the process of writing insufferable? I have a peculiar mode, technique, so I, and I, you're familiar with my books, so I guess you s sense that, and this is not said self-applaudingly, they're not conventional, they don't have a, uh, I, don't, I don't find writing at all insufferable. I'll just be honest and say that I'm always overwhelmed by more material than I know what to do with. I don't suffer from writer's block. I don't suffer from the, the agony of what's going to happen next. I, for better or worse, I don't, I've never experienced that. There's just an overwhelming, which maybe is a proof of my own, my own, I'll just go out on a limb and say my own inferiority as a writer. I just, there's just too much there for me to have time to, 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 to feel tortured or, 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 uh, so, so uh, I guess an answer to your question, which I probably haven't answered is writing is never insufferable for me. Is it pleasurable? Uh, well, it's, I won't say it's where I feel most alive because that has a kind of, I don't know, superficiality about it. That's, that's when I feel that I'm getting to the core of things, to the core of myself. That's what's most important to me. I feel I'm making, and again, this is just about me. The rest of the world could think that what I write is pure excrement. I feel that I'm getting to the roots of being. To, 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 I can't express it any other way. That I'm, I'm at the core and that I'm saying something that's never been said before. And... I mean, there are moments when I feel my 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 packets, my material is the supply is dwindling, but it doesn't last for long, because there's always something out in the world that makes me uncomfortable or excites me, and and so 
no, writing is never insufferable. Maybe that's bad. Maybe I should feel... No. I'm, I'm, go- I'm glad to hear that because I think uh, the suffering writer laboring over their work is in some sense romanticized. And for me, it's very pleasurable to write. Not that I don't come across, you know, a problem or here or there that I have to work out, but that's just part of the process that I welcome or at least deal with without letting it affect the process as a whole. And so, yes, I'm glad to hear that there's some overlap in our approaches, regardless of the external world that we have to deal with. Well, I'll just mention, I, I, don't, I love to do public relations work for George Balanchine. He was a great artist, in my view, a choreographer. So, and I can compare him to Jerome Robbins, another great choreographer. Balanchine, I think, was the greater of the two. I'm, you know, I'm obsessed with greatness. Canons, uh, Jews, I'll be honest, are as a as a as an ethnicity always obsessed with canons and levels of greatness, and it can be irritating. But in any case, Balanchine was the type of artist who had an infinite fecundity. There was never a, and he, he, that made him kind of genial. He was very not dictatorial. He was very understanding of his dancers. He knew what was some of them could do or couldn't do, and what he had to, what what he had to cultivate in their bodies. Uh, and so, if he had to change something, his attitude as well. It's okay. We'll make this change. There'll be another ten ballets after that, or fifty that I'm going to make. This is not the end of the world. Jerome Robbins was very neurotically obsessed with getting it right. He was a, a, a real tyrant. Everything had to be perfect, whatever that means. I just, the, the Balanchinian aesthetic, whatever you want to call it, I, I feel much, much closer to. Okay, you know, s- uh, someone were to perform or stage a play and they wanted to do it their way, that's great. Why should they get involved at all if, if they're supposed to to feel constricted by what I deem to be the truth or the right way to you know to to to, to perform something? I, I wouldn't want to I wouldn't want to be in that position if someone gave me a I don't know a play to to stage to mount. I would like to feel free even to do it in a way that that defaces or or def, defames the the work. It's a form of, I'm providing a form of expression, a new dimension. Anyway, I, does this make sense to you? Or you please tell me if it doesn't. The nugget that I got from what you just said is that you're, you're reaching toward perfection. I'd like to think that, that the idea of perfection is secondary. I just need to feel an infinite fecundity, we'll call it. Oh, okay. The, the perfection, I mean, I know I think with something, although... You know, we're not necessarily the best judge of our own work. Henrik Ibsen, I remember reading, felt that uh, an early play of his was his greatest work, which some critic commented, well, that just shows what a poor reader of his own work Ibsen was. But I just know, for me, when something is right or feels right, whether it's perfection, I don't know. I, I think there's certain should be a certain roughness about the work. I mean, but I guess there are books I love that are that people would consider. Jane Austen, I would say, is you know perfect in a certain sense. I was just going to say, if if you are someone in in a sense who reaches perf- for perfection, then you've set yourself up for <laughs> uh, quite an ordeal writing a twelve hundred page novel with Invitica. Well, I I've somehow coined the phrase in an earlier book that perfection is knowing how to, with, uh, I, don't, I don't know what, uh, talent, uh, whatever you want to call it, is being able to withdraw from perfection at the right moment. I'm not quite sure what I meant by it, but it stuck with me. And maybe, maybe it was a kind of uh, painkiller or a uh, something to hold on to when I felt I was not producing something that was flawless and would would be the the cat's meow of of all the critics and journalists out there. That sounds at least somewhat obliquely related to 
to the truism that no book is ever truly finished and you simply have to, at some point, abandon it, get it published, put it out there? Well, uh, again, I'm no scholar, but Paul Valéry, the French poet, did say that poems are not finished, they're abandoned, which, you know, echoes what you're saying. And also, uh, well, Chekhov, that the worst, that the, I think I'm paraphrasing him, the worst, uh, the hardest part and the most untruthful part of many works of fiction is the ending. So that the, so ending becomes a kind of invitation to falsehood or, or, uh, T tidiness and that he somehow I, I i i would say in many of his stories just the story kind of rather than just ends is fades away in a certain sense i don't know if that's the that's the phrase that comes to me now but i i felt i understood what he he was conveying how did you grapple with the ending for invitica it changed uh, changed in this final version, I so at the risk of of being crucified, I would say that the ending could there could be a million different alternative endings. Uh, if I waited longer, that the ending might have been ended up being even more different. And I felt once I had given given the book away for publication to Tough Poets Press to which you introduced me and which I'll never forget or mm -hmm. thank you enough. I, I think if I'd waited, I would, uh, the ending would have been different because I would have had more material that I simply needed to incorporate it. That, that if this book did not contain the latest, I don't know, bulletin, news bulletin, that it was in, would be incomplete. You can say that's neurotic thinking and that I'm unable to conform to the strictures of good writing or creative writing, but this is how I work. So I have a sense of, of the novelist being a creator, like a deity, who is working on their cosmos, the manuscript, uh, but can never contain everything in it because that manuscript is in itself beholden to the macrocosm. And so there really is never going to be a novel that can contain everything because it itself is contained in everything, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. I, I, I always feel that when I finish something that's not really finished, it's just because it's going to lack all of the things that come after. And that's, again, that can be written off as neurotic. I mean, but who cares? At this point, I have nothing to lose. I was, t to be honest, I, this is irrelevant, but, or maybe not, you had spoken of the Chopin recital that you heard. And last night before, as I was preparing for this interview, I was listening to, he's my favorite composer. And uh, I was listening to one of his etudes. For me, his etudes are his greatest composition. I've listened to them all my life. And Douglas Hofstetter, who's a philosopher, science writer, I, mathematician, one of his books just, just asked himself, what would life be like for me? What would life be like without the Chopin etudes? And I... And the answer... Yeah, well, I, I guess it's easy to say life would be unlivable, but it would. It's a it's a very interesting question. It's more of an outcry than a question, but it it's it speaks it spoke spoke to me. And when you and listening last night to this one particular etude over and over and over again, played by different pianists, it it just it's inexhaustible. Would you say that artists are beholden to others? to create their art, to produce their art, and to get it out there. Beholden to other creators or artists? Anyone or... else other than themselves. In my case, I I would say that. I mean, I don't, uh, I'm not someone who sits down and can weave a story. I, I, I'm very much dependent on, dependent on collisions with the outside world, even if I'm very, 
enclosed in myself and hermit-like in many ways. I, I, I depend on, on, on the out, outside world for nourishment of the world within or the thinking world within. There's that um, sort of age-old, another truism, uh, or Cohen, if you will. If a book is published in the world and no one's around to read it, does it exist? Well, in my case, I would say that it, exi it exists. <laughs> I mean, I, I speak from personal experience. I don't know if with any book's fate was that extreme, but pretty, pretty close, I would say. Does it exist only in the sense of its potential to find readers? Well, I, I would, you know, just sort of flippantly off the top of my head, I'd say yes, uh, no. It, it def definitely does exist, whether or not it finds a reader. It exists, it exists through the, the delusional belief of, and, and, and love of the persons created it. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think that's a very profound answer, but that's, if, I, if I'm honest, I would say that. If my books, I mean, I, I, I don't know if I could have survived in complete isolation, but my... My books exist independent of the rest of the world, and that that some of the most provoking and nasty remarks that i've 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 endured and I'm not saying that as if I'm the only one who's ever endured it comes came from people who said well why do you why do you need to publish this book i mean why is that important? What is it going to do for you uh, Well, it's nice to have something published. It's more than nice. I mean, John Milton, for example, the great English poet, admitted, quote unquote, that he, he lived laborious days, quote unquote, because of his desire for fame and recognition. But if it doesn't happen, it doesn't come, the, the work still exists. Maybe it's not going to exist. It'll exist in eternity or it'll just disappear, but it exists. I mean, I could go back to the books that, that were were whose level of reception was not all that, that great and, and say and see that it existed. I mean, it's, I guess it's a very meat and potatoes view of response to your question. But. To go back a little bit, you, you agreed to some extent that an artist is beholden to other people to create their art. Mm -hmm and basically have an obligation to do it, would you say? Uh, well, I could say in my case, it was not a choice and it came naturally, or uh, I don't know if I love humans or myself enough to uh, you know, applaud their or my own uh, presence as an as a, as a artistic force, but I, I felt there was a, there is or was a need for that kind of, contact. Henry James is a sort of special case, I would say. I mean, he had his brother and he did, he was dining out every night in London when he was very, I guess, gregarious in a hermit-like kind of way. F.R. Levis described him as a, a hermit living in the midst of society. Well, but I guess it took very little human contact for him to be inspired. Although he had his brother, he had a family, and he was close to his brother, so I guess that fed his his hunger for human contact. But what I'm building up to is this fascinating quote that I plucked out of your story collection, "The Limit Point," and it, specifically, it's in the story "Midtown Pythagora," and I would like to read it and then sort of unpack some of it, and it begins, It came to me that the waste of talent, albeit in its tiny way tragic, is at the same time as a tragic thing vastly overrated. If anything, there's already too much talent in the world, and more to the point, the wrong kind of talent. Perhaps, as humankind progresses, it will come to recognize without any bitterness that there is nothing as grandiose as being perpetrator of 
collaborator in the waste of one's own beautiful but unneeded and unwanted talent. And then skipping forward a bit, infinite power derives from knowing one could have produced a masterpiece, but that, pursuant to some unfathomable punctilio, one refrain and let the sands of genius slip through the sieve of stubby ink or paint or clay or feces-stained fingers. Well, I'd forgotten all about that uh, passage, and I'm um, flattered that you dug it up. And uh, I was thinking about it, preparing for this interview, this podcast, sorry. I think there's a perversity about that remark. I think it can be considered, I think it's saved from cleverness because I think it does convey the pain and the its own insincerity that but when it when the the core of that passage came to me, it just it just seemed right and correct. It was not. It, it wasn't, I mean, I could hear myself say, oh, come on now, this is not the greatest triumph. But it, it came to me unbidden, and it had a, a rightness. And, a, and in, in all of that perversity, and you could say coyness, there's a core of, of authenticity, of genuineness. That may, and maybe, even if it's horrible, maybe there is a kind of ultimate triumph in withholding something that is would be ignored would be would be tossed aside there's a, a a kind of strength a kind of victory in a in a perverse uh i mean i'm i'm just suddenly thinking of of kafka again uh, somewhere writing don't do x y or z and don't even don't cheat the world of its triumph uh, I, I I'm forget the entire context, but the the feeling was, the the meaning was don't don't cheat any any one of it of his right to torture you. Don't even don't cheat the world of its triumph against you. I may be misquoting it or misunderstanding it, but this is it was unforgettable to me. It seems. It's it's a recipe, obviously, for for self obliteration or or self immolation, but it had the same kind of perverse sincerity about it. At the risk of being facetious, I remember uh, one of my little favorite quotes from Christopher Hitchens, who said, "Everyone has a book in them, and in most cases, that's where it should remain." <laughs> oh well. <laughs> I... Which brings me to the question, in your quote, what did you mean by the wrong kind of talent? Well, I guess that could be understood as, I mean, if someone says to you, or as I heard, more or less, I have the, you have the wrong kind of talent, if you have no talent, the wrong kind of talent, it's just nasty. But I think in that passage, since I was speaking from experience, and I was speaking about myself, I was almost adopting the stance of my tormentors and saying, in, in, in referring to my, ta my own talent as the wrong kind of talent, if it is talent. But some, some uh, as I maybe do ad nauseum in Inviticum, I I'm aware of the word flow taking you, sometimes it takes you where you don't, want to go or know you can go, but there's some kind of truth in it, and you have to accept it and use it. And the wrong kind of talent, well, I don't know quite what that applies to, but I think the idea of having the wrong kind of talent is interesting. I mean, writing has to be interesting. So, so the reader or even I myself is like, well, what does that mean? What does the wrong kind of talent mean? Well, it could mean just you're not you're not going to be picked up by the major publishers, or it can mean something deeper. What that deeper is, I'm not quite sure, but suggestion that talent can be 
can be dangerous, can be uh, a, a kind of inoculation by a by a virus, or it can be uh, I don't know. Uh, when when I when I read that passage again, thanks to your uh, your your archaeology sig- yeah, our <laughs> signal. I I just felt that is interesting. It's ambiguous. It could be read as as smug, as dismissive. But since the writer is is writing about himself to some extent, it has something more. It's far more than just nasty, mean. It's yes. it's it's a kind of well. Let me just say this: the passage is interesting to me because it suggests a kind of acceptance of doom, and at the same time, an effort to make of doom or that acceptance of doom a kind of literary uh, triumph. Mm -hmm. It struck me as almost achingly sincere rather than coy Mm -hmm. or insincere. Uh, But of course, the wrong kind of talent couldn't be more relative. And now I'm thinking of Paul West, who I've been spending a lot of time with, having received his four volumes of sheer fiction, his collections of essays and reviews, uh, in which, among other things, he proves himself to be one of the few people who understand your work on a deeper level with his review of Dyad. Uh, But for him, I think he would agree that the wrong kind of talent, from his perspective, is the talent that uh, is uplifted uh, at large in the publishing world, in the writing world, the talent of writing innocuous, bleached, grammatically correct sentences that don't draw attention to their creator. I have to be fair, I mean, and say that I'm sure there are a lot of books published by the big publishers that maybe can be can be reduced to that but I, uh, anyway. Yeah, let's talk more about Inviticum. I was a bit surprised after having recommended the manuscript to Richard Schober at Tough Poets Press. I was surprised when you told me that you were still t- working on it, toying with it, tinkering with it. Can you tell me w- what kind of things you did with it at the final hour? Uh, a miracle brought me to him uh, I, uh, that's all I'll say. Uh, uh, and of course, you were very, very instrumental and generous. But uh, in answer to your question, well, once I I learned, and I wasn't at all sure that he would publish the book, I I just descended on it, and like a like a jackal. Uh, well, a strange kind of jackal because I didn't tear it apart. I I, I added to it because I, I, when in my case, if someone accepts one of my works, it just induces a hunger to expand it, to enrich it, to to elaborate. That's and I felt in this case, I felt it was it was so extreme that I couldn't. I mean, of course, it would have been easier if he had told me, you can't, please don't touch it. We don't have time. But he was very generous and very uh, patient. And so I I gave it everything I could. And I feel that was a gift that I was able to do that. I felt that it's infinitely richer. And, you know, this is just me talking about the book than it was before he agreed to publish it. Can you give any concrete examples? I'll say this and sort of uh, be honest. I spoke. I mentioned Paul Valéry. I'm not a an authority on his poetry or his prose writings, but he. I never forgot, and I I do believe that if you never forget something someone says or something you've read, that it has infinite. It has infinite meaning. It you have a either a sense a prescience that it's going to, going to have meaning for you later in life. You're going to act it out in some way. But he said of Proust's writing that you have the feeling when you're reading Proust that at any particular point in the novel, you can incorporate it, uh, an infinite amount of new material. 
and that has always stuck with me and that's how i that's how i live my writing life i do believe that any point in the book can be yoked we'll say to to new discoveries insights like a fractal yeah i mean i'm no authority although <laughs> i do i do mention fractals in the book i mean the Mandelbrot's uh, vision of the coast of Britain. I, I again, I speak. I'm a complete dilettante. I speak like an ignoramus. But you said fractals, and I. But but uh, that's how I see literature and an endless expansion. For better or worse, I mean, I I uh, maybe I'm doing myself a disservice. I I do stop. I mean, I, I there are certain books or certain stories that I didn't touch if even if i knew they would be published somewhere i just felt that i could do nothing more with them or to them or inflict any more pain on them but uh with inviticum since it was so long to begin with it was a i i, I had nothing more to lose i mean people who hate my work are certainly not going to uh, they'll go on hating it people who are indifferent to it will go on being indifferent to it so i might as well you know, to to enjoy myself with a particular kind of enjoyment. You could say that, well, uh, that uh, by doing that, that proves uh, that you've never mastered the craft of fic fiction. Well, for me, the, the lore and the beauty of the world of fiction is that it becomes your own world, your own kingdom. And uh, again, I have nothing to lose at, the, uh, at this point. So this was the... This was the utter expression of my aesthetic, my vision of, of what a novel should be, and, and I let myself go. But I do think, I mean, what I added to the book was, even within the relatively short span of writing, rewriting it, I mean, I, 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 did not, I did know when to stop. I did, I did try to perfect a particular passage for maximum clarity, even if I felt a compulsion to include it. And there's always the excitement of 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 incorporating something that doesn't quite fit that 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 requires a contortion of what comes before and comes after to 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 include this sort of uh, orphan that doesn't quite fit into the to to the fabric to mix a metaphor. What particular passage did you find yourself trying to perfect in particular? Well, I remember there was, uh, offhand, I would say there was a uh, a packet, and, uh, and I I do try to, as as they used to say in Cliff Notes, poke fun at my own obsession with thought packets. I mean, I think I I can recognize how easy a target that can be of people who hate the work. You know, his his obsession with thought packets. What the hell are thought packets? They're pretentious. They're meaningless. Well, I don't. I don't feel that way. I feel they're sometimes they can be the source of infinite insight or a kind of a kind of assault on conventional notions of insight. In any case, there was there have been passages on ballet, we'll say, on film that needed to be somehow incorporated, somehow assimilated to the book. And I, I need it's very hard to write about uh, movement and, and nonverbal forms of expression. And I felt that I, I could do that to a certain extent, not as a substitute for the, for the ballet or the movie itself, but just as, a, as an exercise, but more than an exercise. We'll call it an exercise in ecstasy. And uh, I tried to make those passages as clear as possible because people may not have seen this particular work. I this particular ballet, this particular film, but to somehow capture the uncapturable. I mean, that has always interested me too. And I tried to do that to the best of my ability here. I mean, it wasn't just to, 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 to incorporate a mention of a Balanchine ballet or a film by Eisenstein just for the sake of doing it. There was an effort to, to meet the challenge of somehow giving expression, verbal expression to a medium that seems to resist verbal expression and 
there's there's just to end on you know just to end i probably am running running on too long but there was an important dance critic i mean she was i, I hate to use that word because it's kind of for the, for the New Yorker, Arlene Croce, and she talked about one ballet, Balanchine Ballet, where she's she felt like Alice in Wonderland. She she is having so many thoughts, and she, she doesn't quite know what the thoughts are or the words, ha having the words for them. And again, this is a case where when I read this, if it had so much meaning for me, it was obviously uh, close to my heart. It was some, it, it, it somehow charted a course for me in the future but yeah how do you somehow she okay she had lots of thoughts as she was watching all this movement well but she couldn't find she didn't know what they were well i kind of would like to know what my thoughts are when i'm watching something that's pure visual not not a pure visual pure audio not not something that involves words i think it's quite ironic that you started in Viticum, you said, as an attempt at a commercial breakthrough. Right. Can you tell me about that initial attempt and how it transmogrified into a beautiful shaggy beast? Well, strange you should ask. I, I guess at one point when I wrote Detour, before I started writing it, I thought I had read uh, Philip Roth's Port Nice Complaint. And I thought, oh, I think I could write something that has that co that maybe co commercial or or mass appeal. But it, it it was not possible because when I immediately when I started write, writing it, it just whatever you needed to do to make something ex more accessible just couldn't work for me. Mm -hmm. So the same thing happened here. The minute I started writing the book, I, without without employing my to sound maybe pompous but who cares without employing my own method it was meaningless to me i don't like i don't i'm not interested in writing for the sake of writing if i can't write the way i feel i need to write there's no point so i guess you could say i ended up in the same mess when i was writing in viticum and portnoy's complaint is something that although a classic, it's a bit old fashioned, even 20 years ago when you started this. Did you have in mind an updated modern port noise complaint? Or? I, I, this was what I was thinking of when I wrote Detour in 19, the 1970s. Oh, my I, bad. I, I, I thought that that, well, maybe I can, I mean, obviously not write port noise complaint, but, but have a, uh, I mean, there'd be some, what I guess I, I definitely admired, I mean, uh, you know, Philip is not my one of my guardian angels, and wherever he is, I'm sure he doesn't need me to to approve or disapprove. But was the shamelessness I, uh, of his writing? I, I admire that people. He was shame, not just the, the sexual content, but his 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 his. Well, I I felt queasy about it. His his denunciation and his satirizing of his own ethnic group which has enough problems of its own. But there was a shamelessness. I don't care. This is my truth. And if you're shocked, good. I'm glad you're shocked. I'm putting words in his mouth or maybe not. And uh, I felt, well, maybe I could do that. But uh, And I guess there are some shocking things in Detour, but I've really felt the ending when I, I, I did re rewrite it or expand it or whatever you want to call it in 2003. I felt that the ending, as I had writ written it originally, was as my first publisher correctly said. You know, it was. Uh, I really needed to. Uh, to how can I put it? Set, uh, quarterize it or or eliminate certain elements. They just seem very lame and limp and stupid. I want to get the timeline clear here. So you had the seed of it back. When you were writing Detour, no, uh, of Inviticum, yes, no, no, actually, I uh, it came much later. It was around the year two thousand. I thought of writing a book, which I I, uh, I provisionally called The Sisters, 
there is a, a sister's element in, in Viticum, uh, two sisters, where the envy, the envy factor is very strong. And I, I'm very fond of that, that, that stretch of that, that very long passage of their, their very unpleasant, painful, envy charged relationship. Uh, but then it expanded into the into the novel that everyone everyone knows and loves at this point. But uh, but uh, it's it's too. It, I'd say that it was about the year two thousand after I finished writing. Uh, we can report them, which got some very almost laughably nasty reviews. I mean, not all of them, but a few that stand out as real gems of the genre. What I like, one thing that I appreciate about these big, shaggy beasts is, you know, the idea of a writer wrestling with his or her imagination for long stretches of time. And I'm thinking of William H. Gass's The Tunnel, mm -hmm. Marguerite Young's Miss McIntosh, My Darling, both of those taking around uh, several decades. Uh, what I later found out and was fascinated by in particular was that Gass basically composed the vast majority of his tunnel mentally and then it wasn't until maybe a few years at the end of that stretch that he sat down and wrote the whole thing. Was that what you did or were you sort of working on this religiously, daily, uh, what was that like? Well, I guess I can say this. I do. I. I. Maybe, it's a proof of my unworthiness of a literary vocation, as it's understood. But I don't. I, I don't carry around a somehow, and I don't want to. I. I don't want to uh, mischaracterize him. But I don't. I don't carry around a sense of a book in my head. I. What what you're saying reminds me of some other writer. I can't really. For me, it's it, the book starts to, starts to be written formally after I have acquired a vast number of thought packets, which have or are made to have a connection with this book. There was a sense it's two sisters or. Uh, drug trial, drugs, what they mean, pharmacons, cures that are also poisons. I mean, all of this was floating around, but all of this to root this to, to what's the word? To, yeah, to, I guess to root this in the soil of the book was all dependent on the thought packets, which were like sketches in a, like sketches a painter might make. And they had to be forced into the, the body of this of this behemoth, they had to shape it. They had to, I mean, again, I don't think this will necessarily, my method, quote unquote, will endear me to all the people out there who loathe everything I write or are indifferent to it. But there, there's a need, there's a war, a constant push and pull between a storyline, which sort of exists. I don't think anyone who writes can avoid a story and I don't think my difficulty with telling stories is a, an act. It's just, it's constitutional. I come by it honestly. But there's a constant push and pull between the story as, as, it's, as it's forming and the packets, which, which come first, which are more important. Each element depends on the other and each element is trying to upstage the other. And this is what keeps the, the book going. And I don't know if that, does that resonate for you at all? Or is it just yes, yes. gobbledygook? Or? No. Well, so you weren't working on anything else, say taking a break from Inviticum, or were you going headlong through this book the well, entire two decades or so? No, I, re, I rewrote Detour because someone, I, I, I don't know if I would have, I, I wrote a total of three books during this period. Oh, no, actually, no, there were one, two, 
So there are four, actually there are four. I would not have written them, I don't think. I would have, if I hadn't, th there wasn't a willingness on the part of a few people separately to publish these other books I wrote. So I was rewriting Detour in 2003 because someone uh, named Michael Neff, who he loved Detour, and I, if I was going to have it republished, I wanted to improve it, quote unquote, sort of like in Viticum. And then after that, I wrote another book, the one, the book of stories from which you took that passage. Uh, and then I also wrote, oh yeah, there were th a total of three, I'm sorry, Lurianics, which was also, which was published uh, by Kevin Bigos, who had published two books decades before. But uh, so the work on Inviticum was, was interrupted at those three points. But at the later, later part of the tens, I, I, I finished the first complete version. Did you welcome those other works as a, as a break from Inviticum that allowed you to recharge and come back to it refreshed? Well, well, the third Lurianics was in fact a rewrite of a book that I had written in the eighties. I mean, my first publisher went out of business, so that book, which he had been interested in doing, was was not going to be published. So this was an opportunity to again. Uh, I I just it was rewritten from beginning to end, but a lot of new material was added, and this was a like a a gift to be able to, but I, d I didn't carry around a clear storyline or a clear mental image the way you described gas as doing it. Was there any point where you were just sick of working on it and wanted to be done with it? Or did you just welcome it as a, as a almost lifelong project or? No, I, I, well, and to, just not to, to bore you with the, the soggy history of the book, but I finished it, I think, in 2018, and uh, I tr tested the waters in various places. Uh, and someone who was reissuing the earlier books, I, I sort of shopped it around with little success, and I asked him at a certain point if he'd be willing to do it. He said he would, and then there was a an unpleasant realization a year later that ultimately in 2022, I think, that he really wasn't interested in doing it at all, but he was being too, uh, let's say, timid to tell me that he did not want to do it, and uh, uh, it would fall like a thud, and it was... Uh... So, I, at that point... Well, when he said he when he said he would publish it, I I went through it and and reworked it, and then when I ended, uh, w when that possibility ended, and it seemed that someone else would publish it, I also I think rewrote it, and finally when after Rick Schober said he would he would be willing to publish it, I went through it as you know again, and so there was there were changes. I I tried to I tried to independently of adding new material, I tried to clarify what seemed to be clarifiable uh, or lend, would lend itself to greater clarity. But largely it was an, an additive process. I don't, I think I went, it probably went off the, went off the tracks here in terms of what you asked me. But I ne there was never a time when I got sick of it. I think I was, looking back, I'm amazed at how I was able to go back over it so many times uh, in the face of, you'll forgive the expression, in the face of adversity, or in the final case with Rick Schober, in the face of, of opportunity. Mm. You mentioned Viticum as being the sort of distillation or prime example of your aesthetic. And I'm beginning to formulate a notion of your aesthetic after reading several of your works and 
And I'm not saying this in a way that is critical of you as a person, but you, you know, you come across as someone who is a bit self-conscious, shall we say. Very much like another writer who I admire and who is, is one of my guiding stars, David Foster Wallace. And so I can't help but make comparisons between you two, especially with the pro style. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a big difference between you two, which I'll get to in a moment. But your prose is as self-conscious as, as Michael Brodsky, the person, if not more so. And that is partly what made me ask if writing is pleasurable or not. Because there's a second guessing, the essence of the sentences, if you know what I'm getting at. Which for me is a pleasure to read. But I was curious about their origin. And if you labor over sentences in order to, you know, have thought packets within thought packets, as it were. I mean, you mentioned the fractal, so I guess I'm answering my own question with what you said earlier, but maybe you can comment more on that. Well, I'll say I know, I don't, and maybe that's, you know, I'm sure my, my, my just, what's the word? Detractors would uh, be guffawing or sneering. I, I don't, I can't say at all that I labor over my sentences. They come out, I mean, the sentences are always in the service of a packet, an insight, uh, a discovery. And that gives me a tremendous sense of security and a sense of authenticity. I'm not sitting and trying to, uh, try, uh, trying to force dialogue or plot turns out of myself. The, the, whatever plot turns or, uh, or, or or shifts in shifts in story material take place are at the service of a, a packet of the moment. Uh, the one of the persons, the few people who stage my plays, commented at one point during a rehearsal that I, I tried to describe my process, my method, and he said, "Oh, you mean the uh, these." these outpourings or these bursts of, of, of whatever you want to call them, analysis, insight, are localized, meaning that uh, they're, they're not, if they're part of a broader pattern or message, that's, uh, that hasn't been planned. It's not factitious. It's, if it happens, it happens. I'm, I'm also talking about the the self-consciousness on the page right. that is literally there in right. the sense that characters question what they say and even question the origin of what they say. And yeah. there's often um, the feeling of the characters or the prose being conducted by a some body <laughs> and the some body, of course, being the author, you. Right. Well, I... I am super self-conscious uh, for any number of reasons. I mean, it's 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 uh, it's a defense against vulnerability. It's 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 proleptic. It's an effort to to anticipate the danger that a particular person or situation can put me in. But it's second nature to me. I have been, as someone reading the book will see that, I mean, from relatively early age, I mean, age 11, I was, I've had my encounters with psychiatrists, psychologists, I and mean, there was a need to, to be able to speak to someone who could listen to all I had to say without being aghast or, or shocked or, or, I mean, there were, there were elements of shock, but uh, at times, but I think that was the fault of the, of the, of the, of the mental health professional. And if they, they were shocked, then they had to look at themselves and ask, am I in the right profession? But that's become second nature to me, to listen to myself. I was in psychoanalysis for traditional orthodox psychoanalysis for three and a half years in Cleveland, which requires a tremendous amount of listening to yourself because 
in, in classical Freudian analysis, which is out of favor, and I guess it's certainly very dictatorial, and it, it, uh, there's a tremendous amount of frustration involved because the, the all-knowing, powerful, godlike psychoanalyst is supposed to intervene minimally so that you have to listen to yourself, hear yourself, uh, saying whatever you have to say. Uh, and I found that extremely helpful. It, I guess, reinforced my certain tendency of, of self-consciousness, but I can't perceive of living without, without that, that constant self-consciousness and awareness of looking outside my, looking in from outside myself and reacting to everything and every anything I think someone else is thinking or seeing, I, I can't help it. It's second nature and it's been an enrichment for me. And I think my reaction to the, to, to writing fiction as I write it requires me to be super self-conscious because you can fall into the trap of certain tricks of the of the fictional trade uh, for creating excitement for creating a sense of momentum and that and much of that is is a, is is artificial yes. it's phony and and I have to at least bring the reader's attention to the fact that I'm I know it's phony and I'm I'm tempted to do it but I'm aware that I'm doing it and I'm going to comment on it or I'm going to analyze why and what what that kind of factitiousness means Yes, and I can I I don't see any point in writing if I cannot do that. I mean, it's interesting sometimes to think, well, maybe I can write something like, I don't know. I love that long story, a short novel, Noon Wine. I suddenly think of by Catherine Ann Porter, but I'm not Catherine Ann Porter, and I, again, I ha like Sherlock Holmes. I mean, he'll forgive me. I I have my method. You turned it into, whether by design or not, a style, the yeah. Brodskian style. Well, although I, I do pr prefer the word, maybe because of I had a, uh, had a high school English teacher who liked me very much, but when I told her I wanted to be a writer, she said, well, but you're not a writer. And, and, and something about, I think she told me that, I, well, you don't have a style yet. And it just, that I mean... I guess for me, style, and you forgive me, it just nothing to do with what you said. Style suggests some a kind of sauce you pour on the, you know, the bare bones of the of the work and use as an additive. For me, I guess voice has something a, a more organic feeling about it. You know, that it's something that you don't plan, you don't, you don't, you don't think about. It's just it's just erupts. I mean, you cultivate, I cultivated it. I think, I think my, my voice underwent a big change in, in Viticum. There's a certain, for me, and, you know, I don't really give a damn what other people think about it. There's a kind of fearlessness, a kind of shamelessness about, about the writing. And I think that helps it because it makes it much less, it probably, I mean, it will be charged, I'm sure, for whoever does comment about it as being arcane as be, but i think the ferocity the directness the the catching myself in the act of being artificial and 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 uh, taking the easy way out of certain narrow narrative devices i think it has enabled me to do that f fearlessly we'll say one of my favorite running gags of yours for lack of a better phrase <laughs> Is when, I don't think it's. Uh, I think that's a very. I'm pleased. Is when you'll you use a, a ten dollar twenty dollar word and then in the brackets you'll say you heard that right, Bob. The first time I <laughs> yes, used that word. <laughs> I, I guess it gets tiresome, but I I can't resist doing that because I, I there's a self conscious need to let the reader know that I cannot do without this word, but I know I know what they're thinking. Mm. I guess that's a constant need that has gotten, I guess you could say, worse over time. I need to I need the other to know that I know what they're thinking. I'm I'm way ahead of you, Bub. I know what you think of me. I know I know what you feel about me. I know about your ambivalence toward me. I mean, sometimes I've been told, well, I don't feel that way at all, but I stick to my guns. It's a it's a defense, you know, I guess you could say in a jargonese. 
but it's I, I, I can't think of life apart from that. I encountered that gag in Lurie Annex several times, and only so far twice in Inviticum, but oh. I read it to my wife, because I enjoy it when it comes up, and I read it to my wife, and she also laughed, so <laughs> well, it works. I'm I mean, for me, it worked. I mean, it's 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 used over and over again. But you know, there are words that are, you know, I think words. Uh, I think in an interview with you, I cleverly, quote unquote, did say that I'm, you know, I think big words have a right to life. You know, the twenty dollar words and ten dollar words. Let 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 me be mystical, which I'm not. I have no religious sense whatsoever. But words are beings. They deserve to be preserved. They have a life. They have a soul. I can't abandon them. Yes. On the highway of, you know, of creation or whatever you want to call what I do. So that's how I could, in a sense, defend them. Yes. And I come across, when I come across these words there, I consider them gems or Nabokovian Lepidoptera, something that deserves to be preserved. And thank you. If, if anything, the writer has an obligation to preserve these words. It's uh, what Alexander Theroux calls a fight against the apocalypse of wordlessness, mm. which is something I've internalized. And uh, while I don't have the the self-consciousness in, in my book, Morphological Echoes, when I use the big words, uh, they're there, whether someone likes them or not. Well, I some of them are, I don't know what percentage, but I'd like in defense of myself, even though you're not accusing me of anything, it's just, some of them are invented, and I felt that I had to invent them. Again, if there's not a sense of necessity and urgency, no matter what you do, then it's fake. Yes. And it's, it's, it's pointless. I mean, I, what, everything, everything I write has been lived in some way, either on the street or in, inside myself or at the moment of writing when this word cries out to be born. You know, I have, and now I, I think there is a, a greater freedom to do that. Sunday's freedom is, you know, Sunday's freedom can be a drawback. You have to re restrain yourself. Freedom is an indulgence. But in the way I'm thinking of freedom now, it's a kind of necessary liberation. But I'm glad you found that the gimmick worked. What are some of the words that you invented? I can't think of any offhand, but there are a few. I'll, I'll look through the book and if I, you know, what I find where I can tell you if you're still interested, but I can't think of any offhand. I, I've also invented some and now, now that I'm on the spot or we're both on the spot, I can't think of it. <laughs> well, I know it's very fashionable now to, I think it is, transform nouns into verbs. And I, but I, I find that repellent in some way because it has a very kind of corporate, uh, hip corporate quality, but I, I can't think of a good example of that, but in any case, uh, that interests me less, but they're just some words that seem to be very convenient to cry out for birth, and uh, I gave it to them. To switch gears, I had a question, and it was simply, I, well, I want to preface it. I was talking with my friend Matt, who was on the show for my Invisible Book Buddies segment a few episodes back. And uh, we're both fanatics, you can say, uh, uh, regarding Dany Damien Chazelle's latest film, Babylon. And he was talking to me about the potential for art in, in terms of redemption. And he described it as these old films that you can sort of unearth decades, if not centuries later, thinking in the future. Mm -hmm. And despite anything that went on behind the scenes, uh, whatever malfeasance, as it were, that doesn't matter because it's completely lost to time. And what we have are these works of art that are essentially timeless. And so art redeems by dint of of the fact that it lasts, whereas hurt is uh, temporal or temporary, 
what are your thoughts on this in particular with uh, novels and with Inviticum? Well, I have the same feeling about art. I mean, I, well, I'd like to, forgetting my books, I'd like to think that books will endure through eternity. I think there's a, I was thinking about why that's so important to me, maybe just constitutional and uh, the fear of death coming from the death of a beloved relative early in life. I don't know, or just some kind of mad doctor-like obsession with being eternal. Uh, but I do have that, it's easy and maybe facile to say that, that romantic vision of art, uh, but I buy into it completely. I, I mean, for me, art has been redemptive. Or art has been my salvation. You did tell me that in Viticum, one of the personal dimensions is the notion of fatherhood or failed fatherhood. Mm -hmm. And while reading, I came across a particularly touching passage that I would like to read some of. And it's about a father who feels compelled to defend himself because he's put on the spot by a therapist and his, and his soon-to-be ex-wife. So he's tempted to remind them, i.e. himself, that he did some things right. He's not all bad. Everybody has some good in them, etc. And he does remind them, or at least the lady therapist, thereby demolishing the Mephistophelian house of cards, which he's just spent so much time building. For example, he took the younger boy to Santa Barbara and Coronada several summers in a row, but then he breaks down, though still upright. He will never forgive the lady therapist for listening and thereby aiding and abetting this thoroughly unnecessary stab at self-attenuation. He tells her so, if for no other purpose than to keep the wife waiting. She thinks she understands. The more he defends himself, the more he seeks to exhume instances of admirable fathering, the more he convicts himself of total failure, and willy-nilly, he does mean total. Isn't that so? Clenching his jaws will have to stand in for a nod of assent. Yes, she's right. Dredging up instances is, a, is completely at war with, completely contradictory to what real fathering must be all about. Real fathering is a monolith of sacrifice that never feels like sacrifice, indivisible into instances, the very act of presenting the severed heads of those instances on the salver of his willed incompetence refuses the very thing those instances are supposed to prove. The true father doesn't build a wall of instances, of evidence around him. He's too busy being true. With all this evidence, he, the untrue father, builds a moat around the fortress of his disability. With all these proofs, he bandages, wraps, and shrouds the mummy of his fatherhood. With the proffer of all these instances, his hideousness is no longer. Was it ever, once and for all? It's in unregenerate flux. Through their accrual, he defers his rendezvous with the immutable and incontrovertible. Through humor, I could say I, I didn't realize it. I... I, I didn't realize how really bad I was, but uh, a, as a as a father, uh, I, I just thought that was a, I guess an ac an accurate or insightful dissection of my my method, <laughs> my technique, and as a parent. And uh, the only thing I'll say here is when you're totally obsessed with one thing. I think it goes beyond, or maybe it doesn't, sheer narcissism. You can cheat others of the time and guidance they need. And I'd like to think that my sins are more of omission than commission. But, I mean, there's no, there's no, there'll never be a, a tally in that area. It's almost a... Uh a common thing in which 
a writer's work isn't read by his or her family. Is that true for you? Oh, I would say so. Yeah, absolutely. And in addition, this, you know, it's, it's, it's given the, the type of writing or the, the untype of unwriting that it is, I mean, that adds to the, because it's easy to, well, ask what I've been asked by strangers, you know, who are just feeling either a kind of concern or, or just feeling mean, <laughs> why bother? You know, your work is not selling, your work is not uh, the toast of the talk shows. So this is just a waste of time that you should be giving, to be uh, investing elsewhere. Well, we talked about redemption in the, in the long run. Would there be any, and I know this is going out on a limb, any sense of redemption in the here and now? I mean, what do you imagine uh, your son making of Inviticum if he were to read it? That's a good question. I guess I, <laughs> I, I try not to think about that because I don't know what the reaction would be. It might inflame rage or it, it might uh, have no impact whatsoever. I, I, I really don't know. I think, I think it will... I don't think it would have a particularly positive effect. I don't think it would help mm. the situation, quite frankly. I wanted to talk maybe a bit briefly about X-Man, who's a kind of alter ego of you, or am I getting that wrong? Well, there, no. Well, there again, I think character building and plot development and storytelling, and I'm not saying it, I'm just stating facts, is not my... In, in a sense, cup of tea. I guess X Men has a character, a, a certain kind of cohesion, but he's really, you know, to use the phrase of the person who staged uh, some of my plays, it's he's he's a sum of localized phenomena. We could say he's the he's the the driver or the the product or the or the byproduct of situations. He's a reason, a basis for monologues, observations. I can't disguise that fact. Is the X uh, erasure? Is it a placeholder? Is it the Greek letter? I guess. Well, I should let you know that Elon Musk is is uh, suing me for, <laughs> for plagiarism, even though, you know, I guess I could do that with more plausibility since I, I predate him, but uh, it's a placeholder, I guess. Now, uh, uh, a placeholder, somehow giving, dreaming up characters, naming them. I, I try to discuss and analyze that in the book. I, it just seems completely artificial, lame, limp, and repellent to me. So in in Viticum, rather than use X, I guess I used prefabricated names for characters. They're either characters in, in a novel, names of, of artists of various types, and that somehow is a liberation in a way. Does X-Man appear in, in Viticum? Is there a cameo to look forward to? No, no, not as far as that's... I do mention other books of mine in a kind of slightly coy public relations way because it's sort of a what the hell, why not? But uh, no, he, he doesn't make a cameo in, in the book. This is a staple question that I've, I'm trying to get traction with. You're my second author interview on this podcast, not counting Invisible Book Buddies. And the question is, what is a book that has had the most profound effect on you, whether in your personal life, your writing life, or all of the above? Well, that's a good question. I would say that Henry James has been the most important writer to me. I mean, he, he was, we'll say, a fa first love. And it's like Chopin. I mean, he was my first love as a composer. And every other composer that I've loved after that just doesn't have quite the same same impact or meaning or, or resonance. Uh, I guess it would have to be a novel by James, although I, for some reason, this pops into my head, Washington Square. 
It's interesting that James didn't consider consider this book worthy of inclusion in what's called the New York edition of his work, which was put out toward the end of his life. And he, I guess he, he commented that he loved complexity and uh, Washington Square is not necessarily an easy read, but it doesn't have the, the impenetrability of the later, later works. But I just think of it offhand. I mean, I think Proust has had a, mo a more, much more vocational related importance, but there's something about Washington Square and its, its exquisite simplicity, its sadness, and the, the, the beauty of the writing. I mean, it's, and I, I, I'm hesitant to use the word beauty because it has a certain sappiness, but it's just a perfect, exquisite, sad, wrenching work of fiction and it's uh, it's what what pops into my head you mentioned proust which reminds me something that i forgot to mention that being the biggest difference between you and david foster wallace and um uh, that would be your let's say dedication to splitting atomic hairs and the action in your work is almost ancillary or far off in the background mm. and what's in the foreground is a kind of Proustian Zeno's arrow uh, mining of of seconds and the seconds within seconds can you comment on that well, there is a passage later on in, in Viticum where I, I, I try to understand where the, one of the characters tries to understand his aversion to a standard novel, novelistic bits of action. Again, Valéry, I don't know why I bring him up so often because he's not my favorite writer, but he did, and I, and I, and I mentioned this in the book, he, he commented that he could never write a novel because he could never write a sentence like the Marquis went out at five o'clock in the afternoon. And James, and, and I do pick a passage from one of James's stories where there is a, a physical movement or a, a physical event of, of walking and it's never straightforward. It's, 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 it's caught in the act of not being caught. The, the, the main character remarks on this movement of a, of a, of a, another character which he, which he wasn't aware of, so that anything and everything is done to somehow avoid this kind of very straightforward, he walked into the next room or this, that, or the other. Sometimes there's a kind of malignant pleasure in writing a, a sentence like that. I do that almost self-sarcastically or satirically for my own displeasure. The, there are a few sentences that self-consciously appear in the book and are sort of called attention to and maybe even analyzed a little, but that, that I have, I have a tremendous aversion to it. It isn't, it, it's, it's not an affectation. It's strong within me. It's kind and James said, does say, I mean, he was the, the Santa Claus, the, 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 the father superior of consciousness for him, what was what was drama, what was meaning, was, was consciousness, whatever that comes to and whatever that means. And that, for me, is the case. I do think I was able in this book to make the work and the activities of consciousness and the, the ravages and the plunderings of consciousness more interesting than in earlier books because I felt liberated by the things that have happened to me, in, especially in the last few years. There's a kind of ferocity, and the fact that Rick Schober agreed to publish the book and has been so understanding and hands off also gave me a certain freedom, a sense of liberty. But maybe it just comes, the shamelessness comes, or the the foregrounding of what I can do and won't or won't do comes to the fore because 
I have nothing to lose and I felt feel a kind of liberation, a kind of freedom. If you don't, you know, if you don't like it, don't read it. I mean, I shouldn't say that mm -hmm. because I don't want for his sake diminish the readership, but this is what is I, I, I think I've slightly deviated from what you were asking me. I have a I have a suspicion that Inviticum is one of the most important books to be published this century alongside uh, Alexander Theroux's Laura Warholic and David Foster Wallace's posthumous The Pale King. And what I'm building up to is how do you continue after writing the book? Because I was surprised to read in your uh, author bio that you're working on already uh, another novel rather than taking a much deserved uh, sabbatical uh, and the novels tentatively titled bull by the horns so what can you tell me about the novel and about the act of following up a grand work like in Viticum? well i'm flattered by your characterization and of course there's also there is always an element of insincerity about being flattered because but my insecurities are real and so i it's not just insincerity, but I, I was moved by what you just said. I started working on The Bull by the Horns uh, a few years ago. I stopped when I learned that, that Inviticum would be published. And it was a kind of sort of a disappointment that I had to put it aside. And since I stopped work on Inviticum, I've accumulated, and I, I, hate, I hate making it sound so, I don't know, so unpoetical, a, a, tr a, a vast new number of thought packets. And at the same time, there's a, there's an effort to find, I, I subscribe to two journals, well, one journal, Science Magazine, and the other Scientific American, and I'm constantly looking there much of the material is over my head, but often I will find in specifically articles on the on the on the mental life or emotional life of animals, which which become instantly metaphoric and which I can apply to what I'm writing at the moment. So, based on all of this, I am I have, as a parent would say, I have my hands full, but. Uh, so I would like to get back to it. Uh, I am, I am exhausted to be honest from, from, because I do work semi full time or have been in, at the same time as I was rewriting in Viticum, but this is, this is the same old urgency, the same old sense of urgency. And, uh, again, I can't change my method very much. I think a psychoanalyst or one of the psychoanalysts I've sp seen who, who the one I saw when I was in medical school was was trying to help me with many problems. One of which was my uh, my the tension between writing and and staying in medical school. And when I described to him how I wrote and the vast the the enormous material I have had accumulated, he was he was trying to put me on the road to normality. Well, normalizing me is a is a is is a is a is a fool's errand, but I, I am, what am I saying? I don't want to get off the track, but, uh, a normal Brodsky wouldn't produce the works that us appreciative readers can enjoy. Well, so, but we I don't want, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be America's <laughs> best love storyteller if I were normal, which is of course what I am. Just kidding. What were you going to say? Sorry. No, I just, I was. I guess in answer to your question, yes, I'm. I ha I'm working on this novel. I'm. I would like to continue. I. I'm preparing for it. And, uh, although that sounds very, I, I find that pretentious, and I. And ty I don't like getting into the agonies of art routine in a sense, but a la Flaubert. But I. I. I feel a tremendous sense of urgency, and time is marching on. So I'd like to get on with it. It's about. Roughly, there is a plot line of about a whistleblower who intentionally or 
in unintentionally has is going to expose the 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 revolting machinations of his father-in-law who is a big wig in a small town it has a lot to do with what are called forever chemicals chemicals that that pollute rivers landscapes and it it it, that's roughly what it's about, but it's it's hard work to somehow stick to or hew to a storyline. But at the same time, I should be grateful that I'm able to, you know, that I've been given the gift of some kind of some kind of s structure or substructure to 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 be the basis. But I, I'm constantly on the lookout for the for the. I don't know the contrivances of fiction because I just feel they they're they're out of character. I admire I admire. It seems they've said the same thing. The film filmmaker Robert Bresson, uh, Balanchine, they they've all they both of them have told their actors and dancers respectively, don't act, don't act, just just concentrate on the movement. We'll say, just concentrate on the thought packets. Don't think about the plot. And that's their method. And I guess without even knowing it, I, this is what I instinctively respond to. I, I like grandiosity, the hysteria you know, of opera, let's say, but don't act. Don't, because it's phony. It's false. It, 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 it destroys everything that's precious. And so... Did I? I hope yes. I answered your question slightly, at least. But. Yes, thank you. I think now we can end with an excerpt from your latest doorstopper, Inviticum. I thought you were going to say your latest showstopper <laughs> in the great Broadway tradition. Well, um, I, I prepared something based on your suggestion, which I thought was excellent. Anyway, it's basically a meditation by the character whose uh, last name is Post, Tom Post. This is one of the few characters who has a name that is not uh, the name of a fictional character like Martin Eden or John Gabriel Borkman from a play by Henry Gibson, or the name of a ballet dancer like Moira Shearer, or Jean Rice, which is the name of another character, which is also the name of a, a British fiction writer whom I feel very close to. He just, I don't know why I came up with the name Tom Post, but that's his name. So this is a meditation by Post on the fate of Inviticum, which is his brainchild. We can say he's the mastermind behind Inviticum. And incidentally, he makes a few remarks about Jim Strange, who is the psychoanalyst who is administering talk therapy to the patients who are in the trial for inviticum, the drug. So we have the mastermind behind the drug, and we have this other character. Again, he has a name which is not that of a fictional or character or artist, who is a kind of megalomaniacal figure who is hoping that his talk therapy for these patients who are consumed or profess to be consumed with envy, he's hoping that therapy will make him famous, a household word, viewed as an innovator. So that's pretty much all one needs to know about the references here. At a time like this, though what makes this different from any other time at a time like this, post Warner Metro's chief executive director of drug development and executive vice president for clinical research, experiential marketing, and general regulatory affairs, Post suspects that his too many titles cloud his judgment, cataract his mind's eye. He doubts more and more whether Strange will deliver the goods, but doesn't know what to do with his doubts. 
putting them into cold storage is out of the question. But will it be his fault if strange falls flat on his pasty face? What if in Viticum has been kept far too long in the pipeline? What if the formula has been tampered with too many times, reflecting not the trajectory of the research itself, but rather a not necessarily inevitable internal conflict? What if every step of the drug's development has been marked, marred by, and at the mercy of this or that star researcher's quirky delusions? What if the drug is the mere repository of all the negative affects, not least among them envy, unleashed in the process of coming up and out with a blockbuster to end all blockbusters, that envy itself might be built into the very structure of a drug designed to combat envy? And if so, is that a good thing? And if no, from what perspective? profit, or cure. There have been so many cooks moiling the broth, and maybe each has been interested in proving only one thing, namely, that he's been hyperactively virtuosic, far beyond the call of duty, during the time allotted for his cameo. So what if this hyperactivity has been at loggerheads with ensuring the efficacy of the final product? Maybe in Viticum in its present form, ostensibly ready for testing, is not a real drug at all, just a sum of disjunct inputs and its identity deformed beyond recognition, complements of pipeline vicissitudes. Maybe it's the victim of identity theft, which in this case, began long before it could lay claim to anything remotely resembling an identity. Identity, that overrated body organ. Maybe it was right from the start that refinement of form and function for the good of Inviticum's target population took a back seat, a back seat to manipulation undertaken merely to, say, put an overweening rival in his place. In any event, he can't help believing that the project has been doomed from the start because of the hush-hush fixation on the off-label, the marginal, the peripheral use of the drug, the to-be-approved use understood to be a mere supplement, an excrescence, an unsightly wart on the body pharmacologic. Still, he's rooting for this slate of hand to succeed handsomely. Not because of the sums involved. He just likes to see something central getting by being shunted to the sidelines. It's comeuppance for the sheer presumption of being central. But if Strange gets in the way of the drugs being approved, if the drugs on label efficacy is played down by that quack through his megalomaniacal insistence on the far greater efficacy of his very own brand of talk of blue streak therapy. If on-label use can't get its foot in the door, then how will off make them a mint? In addition, should the new crowd of trial subjects be alerted on their consent form, say, to the fact that based on experiments on death row inmates, and the terminally ill, not to mention the serious post he warns himself to no avail, not to mention rodents, gibbons, cassowaries, and the like. A side effect of imbidicum has already been discovered, which, the way things looked, may turn out to be the most alarming of an already impressive lot. This is what happens when models are chosen simply because phenotypic features reflect genotype. But it's so much muddy water under the bridge. The side effect in question, he mourns, is the transformation of inarticulate pangs into ungovernable eloquence. 
no evolution, no latency period, no luxurious dormancy, just a mammoth transformation, even after a single dose, with the natural reaction being to fight against impregnation, straitjacketing, by that generic form of eloquence, which prevents the sufferer from earning the hard way, his own form of idiosyncrasy. Wonderful. Thank you, Michael, for taking the time, and it's been a thank pleasure you. talking with you. And uh, also, thank you on behalf of all readers who are looking to read something that it doesn't pander and is uh, worth the effort to read, rather than another bleached blockbuster. <laughs> thank you very much for the kind words, and I don't say that casually or limply. Thank you very much. Thank you. So there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you'd like to support the show and Michael in one fell swoop, then use the affiliate link in the description to purchase a copy of Inviticum. Be sure to check out my earlier text interview with Michael at thekaleidoscope.com. If you believe in the work I do and what early access to content like this, among other benefits, consider supporting my efforts at patreon.com forward slash the kaleidoscope. Together, we can fight against the apocalypse of wordlessness. Thank you, and as always, be sure to tune in again next time.